Anything is possible. New freezer, it's a lot of them. Matt, what's up, man? How we doing? Doing good. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Dude, of course. I'm I'm doing great. How are you? Can't complain. I'm uh, in are Hawaii you... right now. Escape where, the, where, uh... where, in, where in Hawaii are you coming from? I'm on Oahu. Awesome. Any, 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 and any reason you're out there just for family or? Um, I was living in LA the past year and then the, in, uh, around June, I came back here, um, got out of my lease when the pandemic started to get bad and family all lives out here. So luckily had a place to live and just staying here for the time being. And we'll probably move back to SoCal at some point in, in the new year. Awesome. Awesome. Well, dude, look what just came in the mail this morning. Yes, I was wondering when it was going to arrive. Awesome. It literally just arrived 10 minutes ago, so I'm going to enjoy some Moku while we're chatting. Perfect. Um, but first off, man, thanks for making time so last minute, right before the holidays. Um, My pleasure. Really excited. You know, obviously, I've known about you guys for a while. Congratulations on the recent launch. I mean, look at the packaging. It looks really beautiful. So Thank congrats, you. my man. Um, but dude, let's, let's kick off high level. Um, you know, guys, episode 28, Matt Feldman from Moku Foods, um, amazing plant-based jerky company. Um, and yeah, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, grew up here in, on Oahu in Hawaii. Um, always really was passionate about the environment and how our choices impacted both the island and, and our planet in general. Um, grew up primarily eating kind of a mix between plant-based and and when I would start a business I wanted it, wanted to incorporate some type of sustainability aspect to it because that was what I cared about and um, out of college I moved to work in tech and while I was there I had uh, you know stumbled upon the Kip, uh, Netflix documentaries, Cowspiracy, What the Health, and around 2017, um, gave those both a watch, and after What the Health, I was like, all right, you know, I can, I'll try this vegan thing for two weeks, see how I feel, and um, did it for two weeks with one of my sisters, and felt great after, uh, physically, mentally, spiritually, and um, I was like, all right, I think I can do this, so I just went fully vegan, started a vegan meetup in San Francisco, um, just to meet more people. Um, I didn't know many vegans at the time. I didn't really know much about it, you know, how to, what foods to eat, how to, you know, eat a sustained diet without, you know, burning out of it. And um, uh, during that meetup, I would have everyone bring like a dish or a home, yeah, homemade dish or a meal there. And, um, you know, I, I had missed the taste of meat. I had missed jerky and I was looking for a jerky to, you know, you know, add into my diet in between meals to satisfy myself. And um, I'm also intolerant to both gluten and soy. Um, so I started making mushroom jerky out of the house and um, sampled it out at this meetup, family and friends, and people liked it. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I think it's just a little blurry on your end, so I'm wondering if it's just the Wi-Fi. Oh, um, let me see. Uh... How's that? Any better? Um, it it'll it'll come back. I think it's just like booting up. Um, it'll eventually. Sometimes it'll be blurring in the beginning and come back. But I can hear you clearly. If you want to just keep going, all good. Okay. Um. So anyway, you know, started making this mushroom jerky. Got good feedback from family and friends. So I was like, all right, I'll you know start pursuing this as a business on the side. You know, while I'm working. Um, while I'm not working. So started making it out of the house. Uh, was just. decided to, you know, take it to the next level, I knew I needed, you know, capital to bootstrap and, and hire a, a solid product developer and chef. So um, that process actually uh, involved me, you know, sleeping on friends' couches so I can save, you know, every penny to pay for a chef. Um, and luckily, my tech job, you know, fed, fed us three meals a day. So I was literally saving every, any, every penny for like eight months. Um, and then I hired, I stumbled across... Um, got connected to Thomas Bowman, who is the former product developer at Just, who formulated the, the mayo and the egg. Um, and I got I had lunch with him. And I was actually like, asking him about some of the formulation companies that I was gonna 
I was looking to hire to kind of take my jerky to the next level. And he was like, Hey man, I'm actually leaving just, you know, I can work with you for about six months. He later went on to start Eclipse Foods. Um, but so I was able to work with Thomas um, in the summer of 2018 for about six months. And he took my, you know, jerky recipe and, you know, took it to the next level, uh, worked on the cooking process, the marination, uh, some different flavors in there and really got it to taste and look like meat. So that was like the first step, which kind of made it all real, um, you know, working with Thomas and having a prototype. Um, an unproven product, um, you know, plant-based for in the sense that Yep. No, I mean, anything at all, at any and all meat alternatives are really interesting, whether it's, you know, a daring foods going after plant based chicken beyond meat impossible, simulate with nugs, jerky is an obvious, um, you know, opportunity and makes a ton of sense. Um, I guess, like, I'd like to love, love the process of, of iterating to MVP and, and commercializing. We can dive into that in a bit. I think I want to go back to like, talk to me a little bit about we could talk about Bloom Reach, but I actually would like to start at Cinco, Cinco, is it Cinco Terra Specialty Coffee? Yeah, I can hear you now. Let's, let's okay, dive cool. into just early days. It sounds like you've been kind of entrepreneurial from, from early on. Can you talk a little bit about the, the specialty coffee company, Cinco Terras? Yeah. So um, at that time, I was going to college at Baruch uh, University in, in New York City. And a good friend of mine at the school, a, a kid from Malaysia, um, was selling coffee blends to the for those who have been to New York, there's a bunch of like street vendors who sell donuts and coffee. And a kid I met in one of my classes was um, selling like unique blends to these, um, you know, corner uh, pop ups in, in New York. And um, um, and his English wasn't great. And his coffee was unbelievable. He would source South American beans and um, have them blended in, in New Jersey. And it was unbelievable, um, like the best, I'm not even a coffee drinker, but it was like the best coffee I've tried. And his business skills and his, his English w wasn't great. So I was like, you know, this is really cool what you're doing. You're, you're having your coffee sold on so many different corners in, of Manhattan. And um, I'd love to help you out. So I, I joined forces with him and, you know, it was really like the sales and marketing component of it, but um, helped him, you know, get, you know, the our organic coffee blends out to different cafes, restaurants, um, stands in New York City. Um, and it was it was a fun process, kind of dip my toes in the food and beverage industry. Um, and it, everything went well, except that Melvin, who was the, the formulator and, you know, the, the person behind the whole business got deported after um, college and, you know, couldn't find a, a job that would sponsor him in, in the US, unfortunately. So um, when he went back to Malaysia, we, we dissolved that business, but it was, it was a great experience. Got it. And that and really got your feet wet into trying, you know, food and beverage, a little excitement mm -hmm. there. And then that transitioned into your next business, undorm.com. So I'd love to hear kind of a little bit about that. We don't have to go too into detail, but yeah. it's always really helpful. I mean, so many people want to go build businesses. And even I, I've seen when you try a number of different concepts or kind of take the plunge early learn a lot. It usually translates to a lot of success later on because you've already been through a couple processes. So, no, absolutely. And I think when early on, when you're starting businesses, it's like, there's so much you don't know. And some of the time, the more you don't know, it's actually better because you don't know how hard it is. And you kind of just have to get to each point. And whereas people who do know how hard it is are often um, taken back by wanting to start their own business because they, they know how hard it is. So, um, yeah, so Undorm basically, like I said, was going to school in Manhattan. My, my college was like smack dab in the middle. And um, there are a lot of different colleges in Manhattan. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of dorms to fit the students. So um, two guys on my basketball team, um, the three of us started Undorm. And it's basically a, a student brokerage that helps students in Manhattan find affordable apartments that are, you know, somewhat close to their campuses. Um, and in environments that, you know, are student friendly and, and where students like to live. So um, we focus the entire brokerage on that and, you know, making it easy, easy for students to find apartments and also find affordable apartments. If anyone's ever tried to rent an apartment in 
New York City, the the time frame of like finding the apartment and getting your apps and stuff signed is is you know like you need to do it within like 24, 48 hours. And for students, you need to get they need to get co-signed and um, have a lot of docs signed by their parents and and other people. So um, we just made that process easier for them. So we the three of us got that started. And um, for me, like it was great. We we made some good money in in the first year, but real estate in New York is pretty shady. Um, I knew it wasn't something that I wanted to do long term, but um, you know, my roommate and business partner and teammate is still running the company and they probably have like 15 people now and are doing an awesome job. So um, that was an awesome experience also just to get my feet wet in a different type of uh, business. Super cool. Super cool. So you little exposure to CPG, then tech, then you went to work at Bloom Reach, which was, you know, what, what was that? What were you doing there? Yeah, so Bloomreach is an enterprise e-commerce software company. So they work with um, a lot of the a lot of the larger re- online retailers like Target, Walmart, and Staples, and some of the big guys. Um, they offer a, a different array of software products, from analytics to site search um, to scalable SEO products. Um, so I joined there. A guy on my basketball team at Baruch um, was an account executive there out of New York. And um, so allowed me to get an interview there. And I moved to the Silicon Valley office to start in sales. Um, so I did sales development for a year and then moved to account executive and then um, moved to account management. So it was mostly uh, business and sales and account management oriented. Now, when you were there, were you making of like an iteration or a version of Moku to snack on? Was it something that or, or when did you start even making your first version of plant-based yeah. jerky? A hundred percent. Yeah. So um, when I was there, this probably might have got cut out earlier, but while I was there, you know, I'd gone vegan after watching a couple documentaries and um, started making mushroom jerky out of the house um, and, you know, got some good validation from friends and family and decided to, you know, anytime outside of Bloomreach, I would put towards the jerky. And the first and, thing where, I did, where did you like find the first, like, where did mushrooms even come? Like, wow, I can turn jerky. Like, how did you even come up with mushrooms as a um, starting point? So that vegan meetup that I started, this one girl there was like, you know, someone should make vegan, uh, vegan jerky and bring it. So I started making mushroom jerky. I would buy portobello mushrooms in bulk and slice them up, marinate them, dry them uh, overnight. And it was okay. It wasn't great. Um, but vegans are not hard to please. So they all liked it. But I knew that <laughs> if I wanted to... Uh, I knew that if I wanted to, you know, target the mass consumer, I would have to make it, you know, taste and look like meat. Um, Because, you know, that's the target we're going after is flexitarian. So anyway, um, you know, once I realized that I needed to hire a chef, I, I literally broke my lease and I started just staying with like friends and mentors. And I, I, I knew I needed like 70K to hire like a really good food scientist or product developer to take it to the next level. So I was literally sleeping in like a different house or couch every like three, four weeks. And my company was feeding us three meals a day, luckily. So every penny was just saved for, um, you know, a chef. So I eventually hired Thomas Bowman, who came from Just. And he, like the first prototype he made was like a bacon made from mushrooms. And some of the early pe- pe- people early on that tried it were like blown away. They're like, this is indistinguishable distinguishable from bacon. This is unbelievable. And at the time I was so set on jerky. I'm what, like, we need to real make quick, like real, really quick. Which one, which yeah. one, which one should I try while I have here? Cause you're making me hungry. Um, teriyaki. <laughs> I think teriyaki is the best. All right. One. I'm going to try it. Sorry. Keep going. I'm going to try no, it. So, um, so yeah. So once Thomas finished the first, you know, iterations, um, and I had a small team. Uh, it was basically me. And then um, I had met a guy named Steven Vigilante, who you probably know. I had heard him on a podcast and reached out to him. Um, and he was like one of my early advisors who really opened up a lot of the doors to investors and people in the food industry because I knew no one. But, you know, I was reaching out to founders and just setting up meetings and getting coffee with people. Um, so Matt, I had just to stop type. you. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you. This is the like this tastes like jerk. Like it's un guys, Moku, Hawaiian teriyaki. <laughs> Holy crap. Congrats. Keep going. Thank you. Um it took a long time to get to this to what you're eating right now. So and I and I'll kinda walk through that. Um so had so I had an initial prototype which was really good. Um and 
with the help of Steven Vigilante, he kind of introduced me to a lot of the big players in food. You know, the Thrive Market founders, Soylent founder, June Shine guys, um, got introduced to the Casper co-founder, Neil. And I sampled it out to a bunch of these guys. And luckily, I was able to get them in early as, you know, angel, small check angel investors. And um, I still did not have, you know, any type of production laid out. I thought, I literally thought with this bacon-like prototype, I would be able to just plug it into a co-packer. And I was dead wrong. Um, that process literally took two years to find a scalable co-packer for us. Um, and basically, that involved us trying to make it in a commercial kitchen, which um, was not scalable. It was very difficult. And this process, there's, you know, it's a three-step cooking process that no beef jerkies are doing because mushrooms, you know, act differently from beef. And um, none of the mushroom or vegan jerkies are doing. Uh, we had to, fit, like, learn this stuff. It took hiring Thomas and a guy named Ali Buzari um, in the product development space to come up with the process to, because, like, a lot of the vegan jerkies are either too hard or it's hard to get the full flavor. Um, so, and, and initially, our jerky was very tough. Like, it was very hard to eat. So we had to make a lot of changes there to make it soft, um, soft mouthfeel, but also, like, get that flavor and texture of jerky. So um, from there... You know, got some early angel checks, had no idea what I was doing on the manufacturing side. Worked with, you know, a commercial kitchen, was a disaster. Moved to a co-packer in California, which was a complete disaster. Um, and I'll just tell you a quick side story. Most of our investors don't even know this, but um, we, in our co-packer, we, the first like 2,000 bags, uh, we, had, we were ready to launch over a year ago, September 2019. And I had seen your old packaging. Like I had known a, yeah. a lot about you guys have been following what you were doing. So, yeah, yeah. It's been a journey. Um, so had about 2000 bags made. I was actually about to go to Mexico that day to go to this event and drive there like six hours. And I was just so hyped to get, I was driving, I was driving our to the fulfillment center. It's, it's terrible. I'm like, just like frozen. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, this is not what it's supposed to taste like at all. Texture, how, how bad flavor. are we talking? I sampled it out to the people in the fulfillment center and like some of them were like, this is disgusting. <laughs> and this has been, this is a wow. year, year and a half after I started this, like worked with Thomas, like worked on so many iterations and it just tasted nothing like the trials. And I had no idea what. Eggs right here. So um, I get on the phone with, you know, my business partner, I'm like, we cannot launch this product. It's, it's, this is, I didn't work this hard to do this. So called off the launch, fired the co-packer, put my entire team on pause, small team. I had a full-time marketing person. Um, we had an operations team that we kind of just brought on, put everyone on pause, including myself. Um, and I was like, we need to go back to the drawing board. Luckily we have some capital to, to further the product development. So from there, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a gut shot. Like, I just remember driving to Mexico for six hours and I'm just like, what the F is going on? Like, this is insane. Like, this is not what I intended. This is, in, this is terrible. So anyway, but kept my head up, um, went back to the drawing board, was fortunate enough to hire a guy named Ali Buzari, who I think is the best product, de product developer in the US, not to uh, boost his ego, but shout out Alex. <laughs> Ali. Yeah. Oh, Ali. Ali. Ali sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that took about seven months, you know, starting with him, you know, a month or two later till September of 2020, really. Um, so while we're doing that process, it was literally just product development, moving us into a scalable co-packer. So I brought on um, a woman named Melissa Facina, who has been in the food industry her whole life and, she, you know, pretty much a year to get fully integrated in there. And and add some of our, you know, existing machinery there and teach them the process and do a bunch of trials. Um, this product is, it's like, I'm not really worried about people copying us because it took us so long to figure out this process and with machinery and cooking times and, you know, it, it's just really difficult. Um, I definitely, if I knew that it was this difficult to make from the beginning, who knows if I would have started it. But like I said earlier, like, what you don't know, you don't know. And you kind of just like keep moving up, getting to different stages of the business and um, was fortunate enough to get to a point where, you know, we, we got a great product. We have a great team now. Um, 
we were able to create a lot of buzz for our launch and, and we're just getting started. Well, Matt, there are so many things I want to touch on. First off, I kid you not, I ate the entire bag just now. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's so juicy. Like my biggest fear when I try jerky products is like, it feels dry. It doesn't, you know, I'm just not, I don't like a dry, like a, yeah. I don't eat really eat meat snacks, but like even, even some of the plant-based jerkies I've tried, they don't have that texture. This is juicy and like really flavorful. Um, so congrats on the product. I, I, I would you. say, um, number one, I have to commend you because the amount of work fundraising, the amount of people that you have to organize and it's really like, it's a, it's an orchestra and you're, you know, you're the conductor, you're getting everything to get ready to launch. And then you pull back after you've invested that capital with a co-packer built the infrastructure, you're ready to go. The wherewithal and just ability to pivot and pause I don't think most people would do that. I've actually heard of a lot of founders that'll just launch it and figure it out later, but I, I actually don't agree with that. And I think product is everything. And what you have mm -hmm. here is, is actually absolutely a winning uh, CPG product and brand. And thank you. Um, you know, commend you for the patience. I think patience is one thing that a lot of people in our space don't have because you're chasing investor expectations, headlines mm -hmm. that are coming out about how much capital was raised, fear of other people launching jerkies. I've seen a couple other plant-based jerkies, but this is awesome. Can we talk a little bit about, um, we, I don't know if you know this, with Dream Pops, we went from making this product in my mom's kitchen to four different commercial facilities to now our own mm -hmm. like, facility, our own factory. Can you talk a little bit about what went wrong when you were making this? Because whenever you're going to create something that is truly differentiated, that is this good, I try it. I'm like, there's no way a, a, a stock co-packer is going to make that product. Like I just... We've, we've talked to so many co-packers. So walk me through what happened when you were at a, your own facility starting out making this stuff with your own dehydrators or whatever that process was, and then how you selected this most recent co-packer that didn't work out, and then how you ended up moving to a new specialized process that actually was scalable and worked. Yeah, so you know, early on when we partnered with Thomas Bowman, um, we created a, an awesome prototype, but it wasn't really set to scale. And one of the things that I learned and most food and beverage entrepreneurs in the CPG space learn is that like a kitchen prototype and a scalable product are completely different things. So, you know, once we, you know, tried to scale out the initial prototype in a commercial kitchen, it just, it just wasn't right. Like I think we needed massive scale in order to make that happen. And obviously that's, that's not the way it is when you launch. So we knew we needed to make some iterations to the product um, in order to scale it out, you know, for launch and then, you know, growing, you know, year one and year two um, at sustainable levels. So, um, you know, I think when we went to this co-packer, I think part of it was our fault. We didn't, you know, have a process in place for them that was doable, honestly. And um, there were just many issues with the marination process, which I think is one of the hardest to get down. And, um, and, and honestly, they, they just weren't a great fit for us. I was kind of desperate at the point when I added them on because we were struggling out of our commercial kitchen and, you know, they came to us with all these capabilities and kind of a false promise, but um, I was desperate for it because most beef jerky co-packers don't want to cross, you know, contaminate with plant-based. Um, they just, you know, from a USDA perspective and liability, they just don't want to do it. So, so sounds you know, familiar, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Dairy and honest. yeah, it's, it's interesting. Exactly. Um, so I didn't have many choices and, you know, unfortunately that one didn't work out, but so many of the failures that I've had with Moku or learnings, I should say, we, there was like one huge win out of each of them, even though I was just distraught after each like time, like something really bad happened. Looking back, there was one like huge blessing from each time. And I'm sure the same thing has happened with you and many other entrepreneurs, but, um, that's one thing like I, I try to encourage people like when the shit hits the fan, like try to think of like the one win there and what you, you know, you can take from that anyway. Um, so when we, when we fired that first co-packer, we knew we had, we needed to go back to de development to develop the product to scale. And that's kind of what Ali Buzari did. Um, he tweaked a lot of different processes in our product in order to make it work with a, a, you know, meat jerky co-packer. And, um, I had talked to this, this co-packer that we're using now before they were actually pr producing for another vegan jerky that went <laughs> under. Um, so I knew that they were willing to work with mushrooms and, and plant-based. Um, and I think Melissa's team kind of helped, you know, 
uh, prioritize those conversations. You know, we have an operations team now, like we can support this implementation. It's not just Matt, you know, working with you guys to, you know, get in here. Cause you know, we, we knew we wanted to like launch in a big way and scale this out quickly, not just like a commercial kitchen launch, um, you know, with a couple thousand units a day. So, um, that process took a long time. I mean, it's very difficult. I, I think the hardest part about this is like, no one has done this product before. So we didn't, we weren't able to look back at a process to kind of mimic. Um, we had to create it ourselves. So anyway, over the last year and a half, we've you know been, wor been working with this co-packer and I think Ali was really the real game changer in helping us um, solidify our process in order to make it scalable. Does it require custom engineering or equipment? Um, yes, I, I would say that the beef jerky process is, is not the same as what we do. Ours is a little more complex. Um, so it requires some additional machinery. Um, and also most beef jerkies are just kind of like powdered, um, marinade and dry marinade. I mean, so like you don't have to marinate it, you know, in a tumbler or anything to, you know, get the juices inside the mushrooms. Um, and also mushrooms act in a very different way than, than beef. So we just had to do a lot. There were a lot of learnings there and how it, um, you know, absorb marinade and dry it and everything like that. So a lot of That's trial awesome. and error, really. Yeah. And, and I think just another thing just to touch on is like, there's one thing to build a differentiated product and then the processes that, you know, are required to get to 50 stores, 150 stores, you know, local regional launches. Then there's an entire commercialization process, which it sounds like mm -hmm. is what you guys went through and what we've been going through as well. And that's where I see most startups, you know, not necessarily take it to the next level is realizing that, okay, even if your product is incredible, but you can only supply 70 stores or hundred stores or yeah. whatever it might be, you're never, you, you need to be able to create processes that commercially scale to create millions of units with the same level of quality. Um, so really, really awesome to hear. Um, what tips would you have for somebody who's trying to start out and create something different? Because do you know, like the amount of people that said to us, why are you creating this geometric shaped bar? Why are you like, it's you're, you're going to like, why are you not taking the easier path? Create a regular shape, moon shape, pop, freeze it with this glycol freezing method. Like, were there people who are like, dude, just create a regular plant-based jerky, bring on another co-packer, launch your current product. Um, any tips for people who really want to create a differentiated brand now in such a competitive time? Yeah, luckily we didn't have that much pressure to like, you know, create something that was already out there. Um, yeah, in terms of advice, I would say find a really good chef or product developer to help you um, to differentiate it. And I think like another piece of advice I would give to people that are looking to start a food CPG company is, I know this is tough, but start from the co-packer, like locate and identify your, your manufacturing partner almost before you pr pr like develop the product because what happened with us and a lot of other founders is they develop their product, but there's real no place in mind for them to scale it. Beverage, um, powders, very different. You know, most, most beverages you can scale from, you know that you can scale. Um, not saying it's easy, but like for a product like ours, which has never really been done before in the way that we're doing it, we developed it without any way of scaling it. And, um, and, and even when I was talking to investors early, I thought it would be e easy to plug into a co-packer. And, you know, my pitch was, you know, this is our product, you know, in three, four months, we're going to be working out of a co-packer. And two years later, you know, it took us two years to really figure out. So um, if I had to do it again, I would try to identify a co-packer and either work with their R&D team or my R&D person to work in that co-packer so that when you're developing the product, you know, it can be made to scale. Designing for scale, period. Designing for so, scale. So important. Yeah. And then this is general, but bring on a co-founder or two. <laughs> like there's just so much energy and th there's no diversification of the energy. It just all falls on one person's back. And um, it's a lot. I mean, even though like you're the majority equity holder, that's great and all, but if I had, you know, other people kind of bearing the, the difficult times with me, it would have been a lot easier. And just like spreading the, the expertise around, like, 
I had, I had my hands in everything. I, I, I'm not an expert in any one category, but I had to do everything early on. And it would have been much easier if I had, you know, someone doing the design work or marketing and someone doing the product development or operations and, you know, bringing them on as co-founders would have made, you know, the, the life cycle of the business a lot faster and a lot easier for me. So I would probably never start time. a business again by myself and time, speed to market. Yeah. Yeah. And Matt, I would, I, I really relate to that. One of my biggest weaknesses has been my, I'm a micromanager and trying to do everything. And you think you're going to have great output doing that. But the yeah. reality is the second you empower other people, like your business can take off so much faster. Uh, so I really totally. relate to that. That resonates with me um, a lot. And um, I guess aside from that, let's just talk broader scale. Like in, with regards to Moku, how are you guys going to market now? Um, mm -hmm. Is it, you know, what's the split between thinking about e-com strategy and acquiring customers versus retail? Um, what, where, where are you guys heading uh, for 2021? Yeah, so Jerky is our first product that we're launching, but there's a, a few other meat alternatives that we're going to be launching within the next year, year and a half. Um, so we're starting with Jerky and um, we, you know, we, we, at first we were going to do like a, a mixed approach of direct to consumer and retail um at launch but we we got accepted into amazon's emerging brands program congratulations um, that's awesome thank you thank you yeah and um they were giving us some of their estimates and, and projections of what we can do based on competitor search volume and analysis and when we got into that we were like all right you know we're not raising too much money and obviously a tr like a, a traditional retail launch is is often expensive with you know getting up and running and and um the merchandising fees and promos and all that, as you know. So we we're like, all right, let's, let's for the first three to six months, let's prioritize direct to consumer. So that's um, mokufoods.com, our Shopify site. That's Amazon, which we're going to launch in January. And then that's Thrive Market, um, which we're going to launch in February. So um, the first, you know, probably for the first three months or so, we're going to be focused on those three channels. Um, obviously we're going to be spending a good amount towards ads against uh you know, our, our, for Facebook and, and Instagram, um, and then for Amazon. So, um, yeah, we're going to be shipping, we're shipping six packs of, of Moku on our, on our website across the country, free shipping. Um, and then on Amazon, we're going to offer a three pack so that people don't need to fork, fork over $40 to try the product. And then, um, soon after that, we're going to be, um, pushing it out into stores, probably the natural channel first, the whole foods and the sprouts of the world. Um, and then, later on um well you know once we get some momentum there then we'll launch in traditional retail uh grocery Su super exciting and, and i think two different worlds like we're um our business is the is majority retail based and because mm -hmm. we're ice cream it's tough to ship frozen we mm -hmm. do have a little little e-com but what i will say is i also think it's often underestimated how different a d2c food and beverage company is versus a retail business and the implications mm -hmm. of acquiring customers d2c versus maintaining shelf space getting those velocities up, merchandising, field marketing, getting the turns. Like it's, it's just uh, another thing that I, I really always like to share and talk about, but uh, super exciting. You have a new subscriber. I'm going to be subscribing to you guys. Um, <laughs> awesome. What, um, just in terms, where's Moku five, 10 years from now? Like what, what do these are some intense challenges. You're sleeping on couches. You're killing yourself. It's a lot different than, you know, working at a great company like Bloom Reach. So like what, what gets you up in the day to put yourself through something like this? Because it's not glamorous. Yes, the highs are incredible, but people need to know like this is blood, sweat and tears, you know, 2000 bags, all wrong product, not working. Like what, why, what, what makes you want to do this? Yeah, I mean, I was working a tech job that was super comfortable and, you know, good money, good perks, but I wasn't really waking up feeling excited. And I knew that my passions were in another area. Um, but, you know, when starting a business, you need capital. And I knew that. And um, I, I looked at, you know, the tech job as kind of a stepping stone uh, and a means to an end to get to a certain place financially in order to get this business off the ground. So, um, in the back of my mind, I knew I wanted to start my own business from day one. Um, and I was very passionate about plant-based eating and how our food choices can impact, you know, our environment. And I, I had learned, it was the, when I learned about the, the carbon footprint of the, you know, factory farming and, and beef production, that was kind of what led me to start this. And 
at the time there were like, there was maybe one vegan jerky on the market and it wasn't great. Um, and three years later or two and a half years later, when we launched, there's obviously a lot more, but I'm confident in, you know, the time that we put into the product development, like I think we're by far the best one. And this is just a start. So like, we're, we're going to be, we're, we're working with, um, a restaurant right now that's going to be opening up in LA. We're doing some R and D to put our product in some of their dishes. Um, the Mendocino farms founders are investors in the company. So we're working with them on some cool stuff. Um, whether we launch it in their restaurant or another restaurant, but food service will definitely be something because our product tastes great in, you know, mac and cheese or pizza or stir fries and, and whatnot. Um, and our, the product that we're going to bring to market towards the end of 2021 is more of a, a staple item um, that is, will fit really well into food service. So, so is it yeah, really so, all, and will it, will it always be mushroom based? Is mushroom always the, the, the core foundation or is the broader uh, umbrella, anything that is a meat snack, alternative meat snack, uh, you know, plant-based meat snack is really where your brand will live. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, definitely not tied to mushrooms. I think mush we chose mushrooms because of the texture, the health benefits and the environmental benefits. Um, but I think more importantly, like our ethos is more around whole foods, plants and clean label plant-based. Um, it's, you know, you look at Impossible Burger and, and Beyond Meat, and I think they're, they're, they have a, a great place in the stepping stone from allowing people to eat more sustainably. But when you look at their label and when you, <laughs> when you notice how you feel an hour after eating it, it's not the best. So what we focus on is um, a clean label, but, you know, working hard on the development to get our products to taste like the meat alternative. Um, because there's a spectrum, right? There's the vegan products, which don't taste great. And that's why most people don't eat them. And then you have the impossible burger, which tastes amazing, but the label is compromised. So we want to bridge that gap similar to what you guys are doing. There's obviously a lot of unhealthy vegan ice creams. Um, but we want to bridge that gap and, and make it easier for people to shift to plant-based without compromising on taste, health, or, you know, environment. It's awesome. It's awesome. Well, Matt, I'm, I'm a huge fan, man. This is the first time I got to try it. I think you guys are building a really exciting business and brand. I'm going to send some jerky to some friends, but um, thank you for jumping on and sharing your story. Let's definitely stay in touch um, and really excited for you guys. So, so thanks again. Yeah. Thanks for having me, David. Uh, my family loves getting the, the dream pops at Whole Foods. So we're big fans. I love it. I love it, man. I'm I'm actually going to be in Hawaii next week and uh oh, no way. around maybe we'll get a social distancing uh, a coffee, have some jerky and some ice cream. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. W which island? Oahu? Uh, I'll be on the big island, but I am going to be uh over in in Oahu for a day or two. So, perfect, man. Look forward to meeting you in person. All right, man. Happy holidays. Thanks again, buddy, and congratulations on everything. Thank you so much. Take care. Happy holidays.